Welcome to the Elite Forum Podcast, episode number seven. Andrea Hootie was able to stop by the University of Texas on the way down to NSCA Coaches. And it's a bit start-stop, but had a great, great time catching up with Hootie. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get time to talk to Zach Zillner or Donnie Mabe, who also agreed to come on at some point, but gives me a good excuse to go back to Austin. So Hootie and I discuss Malord, of course, and then largely turned to her whiteboard and start talking about concepts that, that she had written down. So it's a little bit all over the place, but I think in largely a pretty good way. And without further ado, enjoy the conversation with Andrea Hootie. Four Roses is a whiskey? I thought so. Well, I believe you. Bourbon. My grandfather had a big-ass bottle of it, though. That's what grandpas are for. I know. I say that. Actually, I didn't know anyone. <laughs> Grandfathers, but. So since we were talking about Four Roses, do you want to actually start with the Malort? Sure. So. I'm following your lead. I'm a good guess, follower, too. Guess who the one person who politely declined to do a little Malort moment with us Luke was. Luke Bradford. Luke Bradford for the win. Yep. How I'm not shocked. But he's also the guy who said to me. I think at a summer strong event that he was a whiskey guy. But it was at work. Luke is very right. rigid. The rules were in place. Very Cheers. Rigid. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for going through uh, high school and college. It is years. bitter. <laughs> um, that is bitter. <laughs> I'll just get this ready for when we come in. So, Brad uh, Schmidt made the comment that he could feel it in his ears. So that was pretty funny. There are actually... I could feel it in my throat. There are videos online of people like in the faces they make after trying it for the first time. It's bitter. So it's something. I like it, though. It, it, it'll warm you up. Absolutely. It also... Avery had to... What proof is it? I don't know. I think 70, maybe? Um, Avery also brought us a cocktail... From Malora, which is Apernol, a grapefruit rattler, a lemon, and Malora. So it was bitter, too? Kind of eased back <laughs> on how bitter it really was. But So, yeah. So, obviously, you've made a big transition. Are we on? KU. We've been on for a while. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> I do that to everybody. Hopefully that I didn't, make I didn't know we were on. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Don't be. <laughs> You're not the first person. Um, yeah. Now I'm red. <laughs> I didn't know we now were on. Now you're warm <laughs> and red. I'll slide this in into a box. <laughs> That's hysterical. I should have looked at the big red button. The big red button won't tell you everything you need to know because <laughs> I recorded, I thought I recorded a podcast with uh, Jay Thomas, who's in charge of Factor Bikes, who we were talking about, the bikes I have. And the button was red and blinking the whole time. So I thought we were recording, and we were in a coffee shop, so I couldn't really see the readout. Nothing. We had a great conversation. <laughs> like, he had read um, Let My People Surf, which is uh, Patagonia CEO's book about business. And he'd asked all of his employees, including my wife, to read it. Um, is she an employee? She works for Factor Bikes and Champion Systems, yeah. Um, and so then we had this great conversation about business and how he wants to be flexible with his employees and kind of give them a full life, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. yet get everything done you need to. Didn't record it. Nice. Yeah. So I felt well, like we can take two moron. on that right now and have a little bit more flexibility here. Well, we do. <laughs> uh, Jay and I did a second recording too. Okay. So, uh, which was almost all. <clears throat> He ended up signing up for, uh, since we were talking about writing, um, something called Leadboat, which there's a 100-mile mountain bike race in Leadville, Colorado. And then the very next day, there's Steamboat Gravel, 150-mile gravel race. Mm. And he's going to do them both. So How long will that take? Probably longer than he cares for. Um, Ten hours? Um, total riding time, probably between the two might be a bit more. So, and he's, he's in, I think he's in his upper forties, 
That's good. Though. Apologies, Jay, if you're listening. But uh, he uh, was a super strong racer when he raced. When I first moved to Lincoln, I was watching a cross race, and he was in the lead. And, like, when he races, he goes. Yeah. Like, he's not fucking around. Yeah. And he turned and yelled at somebody on his team. I was like, all right, this dude's pretty intense. Hardcore. And some other people we knew were kind of grousing about it. And in my mind, I was just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with There is nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so, um, so speaking of riding, I saw you have the Peloton over there. What are yeah. you doing on that thing? Um, competing with myself and everybody else across the world. Um, so I had my knee replaced, and uh, that was my therapy. So uh, the biking was pretty, like, I've tried to share my experience with physical therapists and doctors um, of the rehab that I had. But, um, yeah, the Peloton was part of that. And uh, I love Allie Love. She's great. Instructor on? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but uh, we tend to compete as a staff and, um, you know, against ourselves, but also with the rest of the world. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing sometimes you get on there and you think it's just going to be an easy ride because you just want to get your legs loose and then it turns into full-blown competition mode that you weren't expecting which is good it's good to surprise yourself like that but um, if I don't feel like riding and I get on there um, you end up loving the ride for sure from the competitive side yeah is, yeah so metrics as scores um, yeah, the, so do they speak. do the cadence and uh, I'm, I'm shuffling in some EF thought, <laughs> right, with that, like oh, using right. the competition module. But yeah, uh, I think if there's, <clears throat> I think with most sort of socially data driven stuff that that at least we've come across, yeah, like converting cool. the metric into a score suddenly yeah. makes things change quite totally. a bit. Totally. And um, what's cool is I have uh, a lot of ex athletes who are now friends, and. Um, like this you kick their a, ass on Peloton? No, they, they kick my butt. <laughs> I'm washed up. <laughs> um, but no, as soon as they see you sign on, I'll get a text and be like, let's go. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So it, that's fun. That That's more fun to know that that relationship is there. That was with just with Cole Aldrich the other day. So he was on our national championship team 2008. And here we are you know almost 12 years later and he's competing with me that's cool know? that's yeah. super cool or i'm competing with him i think <laughs> i'm trying to catch well, him <laughs> one needs the other for that to work <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> it's a symbiotic relationship <laughs> that's how it has to go yeah so. so that's cool that you can can connect with people you know from all over the world and so uh you were telling me a little bit about this earlier the knees physically fine physically fine yeah as, as of right now, yeah. But mentally, you, we're still working on some things. Yeah, so being, um, again, I was a really good athlete when I was 13. Right? That was a really long time. I thought long, the same thing when I was 13. Was a really long time ago. <laughs> that was my prime, so it's been downhill since then. But when I got hurt, um, I think I was 14 or 15, so that's 33 years later. Volleyball and basketball? Yeah, I got hurt playing basketball, but then I got hurt snowboarding, and it was just, you know, that was back in the day when they just tape you up. Yeah, you were hurting, but I was, I don't know, I was just taught, or I wasn't taught, maybe I got good at hiding pain, physical pain, you know, and um, I got really good at it, I think, <laughs> now that I'm talking well, Maybe a little to too good? I think that... <laughs> Whatever that is. Yes, the more talking. Is. <laughs> yes, <more> talking. <laughs> um, but I got really good at dealing with it. And 33 years later, you're like, okay, I'm fixed. But I still couldn't, I couldn't get to where I wanted to be. Like, because I got to be a really good runner years ago. Um, on, a, on a bad uh, knee. On a bad knee, yeah. But that was 20 pounds ago, too. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. A little less worse of a knee 20 pounds ago, and I got I was running half marathons at a 715 pace. Nice, yeah, I was competitive with it, but I, that was when I was running, though, that was the worst I felt like just ached, and my muscles were sore and stiff. Um, so then I got into mountain biking, 
and <clears throat> and biking in general. But uh, yeah, the knee replacement, and then I wanted to get back to that and that intensity that I was, you know, um, taught from my old days at UConn women's basketball, just grinding through whatever you had to do to get whatever goal you wanted. And it did not matter. You just did it and you finished and you tried to finish first. So I was competing with the, the athletes too, um, because I knew back then if I didn't do it, why could I ask them to do it or how could I ask them to do it? So, um, yeah. So then I've been doing hypnotherapy to try to overcome the, uh, obstacle that I've been carrying for 33 years and you don't realize it, right? Like it was just, I was taught to just keep grinding through it, keep grinding through it. But then you're like, holy cow, I think I need therapy. <laughs> Cause it was a monkey on my back. Sure. Any monkey on your back probably deserves Good some to attention. throw that thing off. Yeah. So what is, if you don't mind talking about it, like no, no, no. what's it? So when most people think of hypnosis, yeah, it's not I think the they Hollywood think of like stuff. somebody swinging a watch. Yeah, no, that was, How does so that? I have this, um, the woman who helps me, um, so she's talking to me in a headset. We record the, uh, the session, but my eyes are closed and there's flashing lights. So the light continues to flash, but um, I said, "Did you change the frequency or the how the light came in?" And she said, "No, those are, that's you're just trying to uh, make new connections with how you think of things." So it, it was interesting. I was never like I, I don't think there was at a point where um, I would have like done anything that you know she asked me to do. I was very aware and very conscious of it, but I think it was just trying to build new new connections in my brain. Was that was some of it trying to just get you to relax in the session, or no? Like just, the light had uh, the light. The I don't know what the light was for. I don't. I I didn't look into the science behind it. Gotcha. But, um, it was a flashing light, and it was just at a frequency that was the same. And I think it was white, but with my eyes closed and under go, undergoing the hypnosis. I asked her, I said, during the session, did you change the frequency of the light or the color of the light? And she said, no, that was just how your brain responded to it. So my brain That's was trying to make new connections. Um, and so then you were basically seeing the light differently because of how your brain was yeah. processing information. Yeah. I think so. And now I could be, I'm a That's total novice at it. No, we, we could, we're leaning right at the edge of a wormhole because I've been, um, <laughs> And I will not drop us into this because maybe you and I'd be the only two people that cared. <laughs> but um, so <laughs> I've been looking into uh, there's uh, an interface theory of consciousness, which is short version would be the world as we see it is basically like an interface like you would see on your computer, like mm -hmm. a user interface. And so what reality is is somehow behind that yeah perception and, and yeah reality, and so sure. like there's that concept of binding where our senses don't all operate absolutely in the same speed and so our brain puts that all together yeah and that's what we think oh, we see well that's why i miscommunicate so, with people every day <laughs> <laughs> so take that and drop it down the wormhole and i've been looking into all of that so when you said hypnosis. Yeah, no, I think it's that interesting. That's super fascinating. Because communication you, is a two way street, and you can't, you don't know what other people's experiences are, or where they're coming from, and how they're coming from it. I've gotten a lot better at that, but I used to be so just it is what it is, you know? And now I actually, probably in the last 10 years, I've been leading through empathy, you know? That's well, a hard. Probably, given our ages, yeah, which are what they are, back when we were young athletes, there wasn't a lot of consideration for empathy. It was no, that's more why that's a, why I got good at dealing with pain. Yeah, exactly. exactly. There was no other option. It was what it was. It was that's a good way to put it. it was, that's what you needed to do. There were a lot of cliches that I think we're trying to Uncliche. people are trying to break down now. Uncliche. That's a good Uncliche. way to put it. The bitterness, my lord, not one of them. <laughs> but, um, which, so here, here's kind of a, a cliche that you can speak to a little bit. I'm going to go back to kind of um, inclusiveness or uh, like who we have sort of in the strength conditioning industry versus 
actually being truly inclusive. Because mm-hmm. it is sort of the meathead coach is an overworked cliche in sort of the way the population thinks generically of strength conditioning. Mm-hmm. It's kind of insulting to like literally almost everyone we work with. My father is that way. Like he was a football player. He's 85 and he still has no clue what I do. None. And is he thinks we just lift weights? Not to pick on your dad. Well, that's what I was going to say. Well, like, my dad's is not going to listen to this, so we can talk about my dad. If fair you know. enough. Is, is it because he session? thinks he already knows, like what Absolutely. you do, and doesn't yeah. really? Yeah. Like if we say partial range of motion, he probably doesn't care. No. Nor understand that there's something to potentially care about. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> um. So. Uh, one of the things that I've thought about with Elite Form is we don't have many employees, but they're all guys, right? And so as we grow, that just, it seems silly for that to continue. Yet sort of our shared world, mm-hmm. I don't know what the population <clears throat> Well, I think that's where recruitment comes are. in, right? right? So I think if you want change and you want to see change you got to go get it right so i think there's plenty of women out there i just think that you know as a minority and i talk about this all the time as a minority in a male dominated world or any minority in the world for that matter there are battles and things that you have to fight double hard for because there are perceptions of one's reality we're coming full circle (laughs) well done right thank you um that you know i don't know it's it's interesting because i feel like i've had to um whatever it is double prepare double work double whatever against some of the people in my industry to at least even be sitting at the table and be taken seriously and at this point too i would tell you i'm 20 almost i'm on my 26 year coaching and i probably still don't get taken seriously which is fine that's their problem is it though yes it's not my problem fair enough fair enough because but uh, you know you asked me that 10 years ago and i would say yeah that's their problem or i'm sorry that's my problem you know well it's sort of this may be a weird way to think about it. It's their problem which trickles down to become others pe- other people's problem. And switching that seems like it ought to be a thing to do, so to speak. Well, and again, that's, that's just um, people, I don't know, that's just closed-mindedness or that's uh, not... The fact that you can't listen to other people's opinions or how other people coach, that's that's pretty close-minded or myopic if you can't see outside of that. True, true. Yeah, so one of the things that we want to do um, as Elite Form is like tap into folks who are already well-versed. And you, historically, I mean, we're kind of lucky in that we've seen like kind of your staff for eight years. Mm -hmm. It's not the same spread as you would see at other schools in terms of male to female ratios. Yeah. 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 Um, Did you find that just your position created more interest where, so people, women see you in the position that you have, right? And so that almost gives them an access that if they don't know you're out there, Right, they don't consider that it's a possibility for them. And yeah. I'm just wondering then if you saw a lot of people gravitating toward you and trying to ramp up a career, become a GA, et cetera. Yeah, I get. I uh, social media is an interesting thing, right? Because um, you connect with people that you don't know, and when you do that, you don't know whether to trust them or not. You know what I mean? So I get all, yeah, I I get all kinds of messages and do I want to get back to everyone that reaches out? Absolutely. But at some point then I'm like, you're getting away from what you need to do and who you are and your job. So it, it is impossible for me to get back to everybody, but would I love to? Absolutely. But I don't have a staff to do that. 
you know. Um, so it, you'd it, almost need to hire like a social media manager to absolutely, and and that's I don't need that. I don't want that. <laughs> doesn't really seem like I would not anticipate, like, hey, let me introduce you to X, who's my social media, yeah. but it doesn't seem like anything that's kind of come out of your mouth anytime yeah. soon. But. No. Um, but, yeah, I, mean, I want to create as many opportunities for anyone that I can, and um, because that was created for me. So um, I think the, the, the whole point is be persistent in what you want, right? Because I had to be persistent and to get to where I have gotten um but then the people who actually probably are most successful at access are the ones that continue to reach out because like luke bradford luke like when he would call me i'd be like oh geez and i told him i'd roll my (laughs) eyes i'd see luke bradford so it's okay if he listens to this yeah he knows (laughs) i'm like here's luke calling again and i never had a position for him because he was looking for a full-time job but when a ga uh, position popped open. I said, Luke, I don't have a full time job, but I do have a GA ship. And he said, I'll be there. So that's, that's good. Cool. Yeah. I did not realize. So I was, honestly, I don't remember when it was, but Luke and I already recorded a session. I did not realize when we first met that Luke was a GA. Yeah. And so I will, I think about that. There's some nostalgia with that staff, <laughs> right? Because we met you, uh, you had Joe Staub, Joe. Glenn Kane, yeah. Patricia Dietz. Yep. There's diversity and inclusion right there. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right? um, yeah, so that was the crew, and I didn't realize Luke was a GA. I was like, a, yeah. I'm like, almost a, what did you think was going on? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, so Dietz is now at Wartburg. <clears throat> Glenn's at Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Joe's doing his own thing. He's actually going to end up doing a little bit of work for us, which oh, is nice. pretty cool. Yeah. But so a lot of shared values. Yeah. And it's just interesting to see how they've kind of branched out. But even still today, KU is awfully inclusive in terms of that staff. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've now transitioned here. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of thinking it through, like, <laughs> who was there at that time. So, Doc Fry. Doc Fry, still there. Yeah. So, do you have, is, I know you have a sports scientist here. His, yes, the Travis. The name escapes me. Travis. Right. Um, do you have a similar relationship here with sports science that you um, did with Doc Fry? Or? I'd like to work on that. I am working on that. I mean, you did just that. get here. Yeah. Um, and it's basketball season, but, uh, we met with Dr. Coyle the other day and he's got an iso inertial ergometer bike. Is that an ergometer? Odometer? O- uh, bike cycle. Oh, no, cyclometer. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, a it's a stationary get, bike. There's a lot of terms. To get iso thrown inertial. So, um, I use a power meter. So, yeah. Well, this one is the, the harder you push, the more resistance, right? Or uh, the least okay. amount you push, the least resistance. So I was talking about something else. It's My really bad. cool because we could offset the eccentric loads for basketball on this totally concentric pedaling, you know? So we're always trying to solve our imbalances in that cycle. We want, we want to study that. So a lot of the questions and things that we did with Doc Fry were very organic, and they came from the questions that we had about training and what we could do to make our athletes better. Um, Travis is facilitating our, our workloads and things like that, and it's more testing right now. Um, but this work that we'd like to do with Dr. Croyle could be groundbreaking in terms of uh, the effect that we can have on somebody's impulse, you know, um, as they play basketball. So could we affect somebody's health in a really positive way by offsetting the eccentric load on an iso-inertial bike um, so that we're not running all the time, right? Everybody wants to run their basketball players. Right. Well, this he has a profile or a, a, a protocol set up to increase power output and increase VO2 on a bike, for however many reps. I'll need to have a side conversation Absolutely. with him. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what, what's cool is we could actually have a really big impact on how people train. I have to go meet with Shock. I'll be back. So we are on now. If you want an official... What are we on now? It is recording. Okay. But 
Um, what were we talking about? What's that? What were we talking about? Oh, I don't know. Let's just move on. <laughs> All right. So Next subject. I thought about this while you were <clears throat> giving your... Well, we could talk about championship cultures, but... I'd have to pull up my PowerPoint. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> you just did that. It's redundant. Um, but your whiteboards are always fun. I just erased it, actually. It was full for four months, and we just erased it. That's not a... But it'll fill back up. It'll That's fill one of the back great up. things about yeah, a whiteboard. It'll fill back so up. So you have range of motion is greater than load, and then underneath that, load, load greater, greater than, than range, range of motion. motion. I think when you look at. How are you at, thinking about that? Yeah, when you look at what limits people in a squat, right? So it's either, for us, I'll say, for basketball players, and I, I'll speak generally and, you know try to not say something that people can't leave comments on the right. podcast so you can say whatever <laughs> no you want so our biggest things that we deal with are lack of dorsiflexion ankle mobility and then um you know for some of the what i call utility players or the less athletic players they we have a leak in their system through through their spine thoracic spine and they have an inability to posture when running and jumping and that's where the leak comes so we've been looking through the Elite Form technology how um, we can express our strength better on the court. Like when I was at Kansas, we had a women's basketball player that was a beast in the weight room. She could full clean 80 kilos, catch in a full, you know, it did everything that we asked her to do and did it to the best of her ability. And she was one of the best people in the weight room, but she couldn't express her strength strength on the court because she got good at jogging around because all she did was shoot so she got good at jogging which isn't good for a lateral reactive athlete so the her ability to posture on the court she would just lose it because she just you know would float around the court well maybe defense wasn't a point of emphasis for her so she never adapted to that force production so this is where it started with um, this women's basketball player. So we started uh, looking at, at her weak spots on the court, which was a power position. So then we started loading this power position, not just catching in a hang power clean. We were doing partial range of motion squats. And we saw that the impulse time on the ground decreased and rate of force production and her strength went up because we were overloading her in that posturing or quarter squat position so for that summer she was there for two years she had torn an ACL in high school and uh, that third summer we just did partial squats partial range of motion squats and we did like uh, eccentric dumbbell drops and just things that would tighten up her upper back and and and, and ability to posture um because then you're like, okay, you get to a point where it's like, okay, okay, you can plank forever. So what could we do to stabilize her trunk? And that was overload her in a squat so she could feel that load. But, you know, not get her to the point where she fails through her spine. Um, we don't want that, right? So what we would do is then take 140% of her parallel squat, load that up, uh, and we looked at the work with elite form, so we tried to match the work on a parallel squat with that of a partial squat. Oh, okay. So uh, then from there, then, okay, well, she got good at the partial squat, and then we just lower the pins, another one, lower it again, and lower it again. And we just had the same thing happen here at Texas, where Kamaka is probably 6'10", 6'11", not a great runner and jumper, but has gotten better. Because we've been partial range of motion, partial using partial range of motion on a squat, but he almost parallel squatted 275 the other day, which, again, what's your limiting factor is, is your back, right? So we got good at stabilizing his back in a partial range, and then we're just increasing the range of motion. So some guys, yeah, we want full range, but then some guys, let's overload the partial with, where they're not good and their weakness. Let's Let's train their weakness, which was the power position. And it's been working for us. And we're thinking, you know, top down versus bottom up. And I'm, I'm thinking too, center out, because if we're limited by dorsiflexion and then we're limited by thoracic spine, 
well, what are we doing? (laughs) (laughs) Has have you also seen uh, Zach and I kind of ended up talking about this at, at some point? Does it also help their mental game? Like, I remember this is way back when, of course, but maybe I shouldn't say I remember. Sometimes the idea of a lot of load, like you may know just in your experience watching athlete X lift, Mm -hmm. they can handle X load, but the feeling of that load on your back. Yeah. You got to get used to it. Right. So what we're getting, we're getting them used to the load in a healthy, small range, looking at the work they're doing and not over working them. We're overloading them. Right. Cause we can yeah, follow good distinction, that. Right. Yeah. There's a huge difference between overloading and overworking. And we're using the elite form work tab to keep that workload the same and just manipulate the range. And we've had a ton of success with it, with our athletes who maybe they need a bump in performance. I always call it a ratcheting system between health and performance. We can get them high performing and then they're at risk of an injury, so they're unhealthy. And then let's say we ratchet that unhealthy performance, unhealthy, you know, between health and performance. And I think it's not a cycle. It's how they feel that day. You know, it's like... The ultimate micro cycle day to day. And that's what we do. Because it, it, I think it is important on how they feel every day. Because it was important how I felt every day as an athlete. <laughs> right. Bum knee and all? <laughs> Bum knee. Well, when I was an athlete, when I was 13. <laughs> 13. Right, sorry. That's right. <laughs> you were still an athlete after your injury. It's just... Um, yeah. That's, Lost that's it, though. Come along but I, I would tell you, my, my life's work and goal is to not that, let that happen to another athlete. Because it, it's not fun. So I'm trying to pass on the um, knowledge from the mistakes that I've made, you know, and understand that health is the most important thing. With a little bit of performance thrown in? With a lot of performance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I think there's a good chunk of people that that we work with that would say something similar, maybe not quite in the same words, but like I was, I can't remember who I was joking with, but there's that concept of one percenters. Yeah. And, uh, I was joking Well, I was, I was like a three percenter, right? I wasn't really that good at anything. Yeah. And I think it's coming back as well. I think you describe a lot of the strength and conditioning profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he even threw in, or people who have gotten injured yeah. and never really were able to reach their peak performance. Yeah. Um, no, my, I hit my peak performance. It was when I was 13. At 13. <laughs> oh, you and me both. Downhill from there. You and me both. Uh, so what other, uh, what other concepts have your attention these days? Um, that, that partial range one we're really, really interested in that cycle ergometer with Dr. Coyle is, yeah, that one, that one, if you, if I can have a protocol that increases VO2 max and increases power output for 10 minutes on the bike, I'm sold, you know, cause what are we just going to spin our wheels and run all summer, you know? So, um, I think that one's really important and I can't wait to find out the results of that. So when did he start doing that research? For that He's work? been doing it for a while. Oh. Uh, and, you know, um, I saw a prototype of the bike. There were two over in the lab. Um, did yeah, he design the bike? I believe so. It's, um, it's pretty much an iso-inertial cycle on concentric, just concentric force. And I think it's... Uh, you know, that's the main thing. That's what we're, we're really focused on. But, uh, you know, basketball is such an eccentric loaded one that concentrically these guys are imbalanced between eccentric and concentric. So um, it, it could, I, I think it could have an impact on an athlete's health and performance. And when you mentioned you're looking forward to the sort of findings or whatever coming out? like Well, you- we've, well, I, he has the data, I believe. I don't, okay. I'll have to get back in touch with him. He's got the data, but we we actually want to do it with our guys gotcha. and measure that with our force plate uh, findings. Is that going to be like a postseason? Yeah, it would I, happen I in mean, the spring, never do it in spring the season, or summer. We can just spend the podcast or round two. Yeah, 
and talk about that because that's fascinating to me. Yeah. So. And boy, my uh, light bulb went off in my head when I saw it because it's the total, almost opposite of the K-Box, you know? That's true. I, I, I was totally pumped about it and still am. Um, yeah, and, you know, we've gotten to a point where we do two healthy repetitions or two healthy sets per one performance set to just try to offset all the things that we're asking them to do. So for people who might not know what you mean by a healthy set healthy how are you, um, how are you breaking whether that's down? healthy range of motion like go through the whole range of motion on a squat if you're a partial range of motion person your loaded partial range i still want you to keep the full range and we'll, so we'll load partial but then you know maybe the superset is um calf stretch and uh, a full body weight squat so we do two sets or two exercises healthy ones with a stretch or mobility um, with a performance one because the performance it, it takes its toll it really does because we're driving the sports car as fast as you can and anybody that i've ever talked to the sports car is always in the shop for a tune-up we're just trying to be the tune-up place we're trying to soup up the engine but we're also tuning the car up so we're like the pit crew yeah yeah like the shop and the pit crew. For the shop and the pit crew in the, yeah, engineering department and <laughs> fix the flats. We're the garage. Wax? No. <laughs> no. Everything else. <laughs> not the wax. <laughs> Definitely not the wax. Definitely not. <laughs> So you have also listed on your whiteboard just a, a subset of lifts or movements, it looks like. What was going on there? I was not happy with our performance. and um, In the weight room? or No, on the court. Okay. And <clears throat> I don't know. I, I was like, you know what? They need to lift heavy weight today. <laughs> I need to watch them lift heavy weight today because we hadn't, uh, that was, we, we like to lift heavy at least twice a week, whether it's 15 minutes or 30 minutes, mm -hmm. just load them up. So we had five sets of clean and it, again, we we're operating on low dose, six sets of squat, five sets of bench and heavy prone row. And then, you know, the, the other, uh, offsetting healthy exercises in between. So you're watching the game. But obviously, you bring a set of eyes to the game. I'll call it around human performance, right? And thinking about the weight room, you know, other people seeing sort of the X's and O's side of it, mm -hmm. right? If you can, like, what would be some of the things that you would see that would make you then say, we're going to need to lift heavy weight? Uh, you look at the stat line, right? So we've been talking about rebounding, and you know, we're not a good rebounding team. And what makes a good rebounding team is the physicality of your athletes. So over the last five years, we look at where we're ranked rebounding, and it's not good at all. So we're working on our physicality because our rebounding is so bad. So, I mean, and there, there's other factors to that, too. We look at, we're looking at the Sparta force plate and, and the movement patterns on the catapult, who are our best movers or our best force plate producers you know force production people which it's good to have the data to back that versus just say it right right and then well there's a sub subset of things that coaches see and they're going to be right when you end up looking at data mm -hmm. well and then when their force plate numbers get better their movement gets better so we want to see these guys rank in terms of their movement on the court and, and where they're moving and how they're moving according to their teammates. But I can tell you, the more athletic they become, the higher movers they are, which is – and then I'm doing my job. You know, again, I can't get wins and losses on the basketball court, but I can certainly make them better athletes, which hopefully then, you know, correlates to what we want with basketball. Well, I have to talk about that in terms of probability. I don't know if you and I have had that conversation before, but if I'm even incrementally faster, the probability that I am more successful, or you know, if I jump higher, the probability that I am more successful just goes up. Yeah. 
For sure. No, that's not teaching you how to box out. Or no, but it's teaching you, you possibly more. to get a rebound. Or um, right. if, if your probability goes up and we increase athleticism, do minutes go up? And if minutes go up, does your health stay, you know, there? Because if your minutes go up, normally the probability is your health goes down. Right. But we want your health to continue to go up. You just have to come in for a, a pit stop. Yeah. In Hootie Shop. <laughs> the garage. Get your garage. Um, get you set up. No, but I, I again, it, it's the easiest thing I think there is to do is to make somebody strong. It's the easiest thing, but that doesn't make them a better basketball player. So what needs do they have as a position and the goals of the position for the team for us to be successful? Is that this is my sort of formerly playing basketball brand coming out a little bit, but is there a position on the court that is more challenging in that process than others? Like I think it depends on how the person plays the game because there's the utility like the people, answer. there's skilled people. Oh, there's nuance. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, you have your skilled big man who might not be an athlete and then you got your, your athlete that might not be that skilled. So it depends on who you are. And, and I think this is where, you know, the question of how, how do we create value as a performance coach? Because just because somebody's bench press gets better doesn't mean that they get better. So where's my value? My value is in the health of our athletes. And how do we measure that? Through all the technology that we have. And asking them how they feel. Well, at the, at the end of the day, we were talking about the cognitive side, how they yeah, feel. Right. And their, it's usually almost their belief how they, in how they feel. Yeah. Why would you ever turn down a massage? Right. It, uh, science may be out. I was saying this to Zach. The science may be out on whether it's scientifically mm -hmm. helpful. But just from the placebo effect by itself, if you feel great. Play great. I like your chances. Feel great, play great. feel crappy. Yeah. For sure. For sure. These are all the staples I remember. <clears throat> that one uh, is, okay, well, why, you know, why do people um, fail, right? So the, that one, afraid. since people are just listening, yeah. what we're looking at is uh, at the top it says fear, a little down arrow, then underneath that we have intention. How do you and, decrease fear of performance, really? Yeah. How do you decrease fear? Is intention, by, aggression, confidence, and competence. Yeah, by increasing Intention, increasing aggression, increasing confidence, and increasing competence. So that's how you, this is all the, yeah, this is just basic stuff, right? But it's stuff that we have to remind ourselves that our thoughts dictate our behavior and that it all tied into emotion, and, but we have to practice. <laughs> Fundamentals might be another word. Yeah, but I'll tell people you, like so many people sometimes. miss it. Yeah. Yeah, per practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes, makes perfect. perfect. Practice makes permanent is another yeah. cliche I've heard. Practice makes permanent, yeah. And again, that's why in uh, research is saying that a loaded movement just drives that loaded movement, drives that movement. So maybe that loaded power position movement in a partial range will drive that partial range movement where they normally fail. We're on to something big, Keep something digging. big. Keep digging. Because people have been doing partial range of motion for a while, but they haven't been able to explain it. You know, they just know it works, and it does. What are we doing now? Uh, what do we got? Three o'clock shoot? I can come early, too. So. You want to do two? No, we can do two. All right. Cool. I always tell our interns and our student helpers that I don't care what you do, just do something. And if I don't like what you're doing, I'll tell you, but don't take it personally. So find something to do. Make sure you're always doing something to make us better. Whether that's cleaning, whether that's crunching numbers, whether that, whatever it is, coaching somebody. Um, but that's where people know your role. Because with Gino, Ariama, Everybody had a role. And if you didn't do your role, you didn't have a spot on the team.
even to people that didn't play. If you didn't do your job and do it 100%, you don't belong. And so uh, how have you seen that? Like when you've then moved on, right, and been like here, like how have you stressed that like with the teams that you've been working with? Just kind of kept it simple it is what it is? Or? Well, again, I got to understand my role and where I fit into the process of stuff. Um, so it's also a know your role. It's a know your role too. But I know my role. I'll do my job, right? <laughs> um, it's about, uh, I guess, the players knowing their role. Because, again, everybody wants to play. Well, and then there's that balance of, so you get, I always find it, and some of this may be the dad in me talking, right? There's the recruiting process, which most of the time may or may not lead you to believe you're going to play more than anyone really thinks you will. It's yeah. up to you. Yeah. And then there's almost a rebalancing that seems like takes place. I remember gets, my my coach my coach right? said to me like I remember I was a freshman and I wasn't playing I went into my coach's office and said well, what do I need to do to play more what, what what do I need to work on versus why am I not playing big difference in those huge questions. difference yeah absolutely but I feel like that's why I'm a coach there's a huge difference between those two questions. Well, and even your mentality back then was coaching, more, teaching, more education. More aligned with yeah, what, yeah. A, what a coach would say. I don't know if my coaches would say that. Well, <laughs> for when you were thirteen. <laughs> yeah. No, but what? Uh, and earlier, what I was what I was getting ready to say was one of the things I don't envy with a sport like basketball, or I'm, I'm thinking of soccer as well, but. Like, if we put you on a track, and you're part of the track and field team, what's your time? It's about it's about as objective as it's going to get. Right. Right? And so then, can we incrementally improve everybody? Sure. But in terms of playing time. But they have so many, uh, you know, formulas at this point mm-hmm. to measure your efficiency on your position and what you do. You know, that those numbers don't lie. You think it's as clean? I think it's pretty clean. It's pretty clean. I think so. And if you if you're not playing, you find a way to play, have an impact. I mean, didn't Tom Brady do that? He's the great. I think he's the za- I mean, example he did that everyone goes Bledsoe, to, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he did that. If you're more efficient or more effective, you play. Now that's a hard thing to swallow if you want to play, but find a way to play more. Or find a different role or do something different. And that's just like workplace stuff, right? That I love how sports parallels life. I love it. <clears throat> or workplace or business or whatever. Be an athlete. Yeah, it's... Uh, when I think about that, it's interesting because I do think people talk about how sports prepares you. And I think it's more so than a lot of people even give it credit for. Like, there's the cliche, right? But if you're doing a really good job for your business and you're in a pretty big company, you don't really have to worry too much about somebody coming in and taking your spot. But in sports, you do. Absolutely. Yeah. So it is, in some ways, the ultimate crucible. Well, that's why I'm trying to measure my value because, you know, coaches come and go. Um, strength coaches come and go, but uh, how do I make myself valuable enough that people don't want to lose me? I don't know if that will ever happen, but... Well, I suspect you're always going to be measuring it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So otherwise, it's complacency, right? Yeah, which is the worst place to be. Or, yeah, like not feeling that you can grow. Well, a growth mindset quotes around that, I guess, uh, is the, is the same mindset that asks, what can I do to get playing time? What can I do? Yep. Absolutely. As opposed to why am I not? Yeah. Yeah. I guess those are growth versus fixed questions. That's good. Good job connecting those dots. (laughs) I didn't connect them. You did. (laughs) I'm giving you the credit.